The history of aviation extends for more than 2,000 years, from the earliest forms of aviation such as kites and attempts at tower jumping to supersonic and hypersonic flight by powered, heavier-than-air jets. Kite flying in China dates back to several hundred years BC and slowly spread around the world. It is thought to be the earliest example of man-made flight. Leonardo da Vinci's 15th-century dream of flight found expression in several rational but unscientific designs, though he did not attempt to construct any of them. The discovery of hydrogen gas in the 18th century led to the invention of the hydrogen balloon, at almost exactly the same time that the Montgolfier brothers rediscovered the hot air balloon and began manned flights. Various theories in mechanics by physicists during the same period of time, notably fluid dynamics and Newton's laws of motion, led to the foundation of modern aerodynamics, most notably by Sir George Cayley. Balloons, both free-flying and tethered, began to be used for military purposes from the end of the 18th century, with the French government establishing balloon companies during the Revolution. The term aviation, noun of action from stem of Latin avis, bird, with suffix ation meaning action or progress, was coined in 1863 by French pioneer Guillaume Joseph Gabriel de la Londelle (1812–1886) in Aviation our navigation aérienne sans ballons. Experiments with gliders provided the groundwork for heavier-than-aircraft, and by the early 20th century, advances in engine technology and aerodynamics made controlled, powered flight possible for the first time. The modern aeroplane with its characteristic tail was established by 1909 and from then on the history of the aeroplane became tied to the development of more and more powerful engines. The first great ships of the air were the rigid dirigible balloons pioneered by Ferdinand von Zeppelin, which soon became synonymous with airships and dominated long-distance flight until the 1930s, when large flying boats became popular. After World War II, the flying boats were in their turn replaced by land planes, and the new and immensely powerful jet engine revolutionized both air travel and military aviation. In the latter part of the 20th century the advent of digital electronics produced great advances in flight instrumentation and «fly-by-wire» systems. The 21st century saw the large-scale use of pilotless drones for military, civilian and leisure use. With digital controls, inherently unstable aircraft such as flying wings became possible. <laughs> Primitive beginnings. Topic. Tower jumping From the earliest legends there have been stories of men strapping bird-like wings, stiffened cloaks or other devices to themselves and attempting to fly, typically by jumping off a tower. The Greek legend of Daedalus and Icarus is one of the earliest known, others originated from India, China and the European Middle Age. During this early period the issues of lift, stability and control were not understood, and most attempts ended in serious injury or death. In the 17th century, the Algerian historian Ahmed Muhammad al makari stated that the Andalusian scientist Abbas ibn Firnas made a jump in Córdoba, Spain, covering his body with vulture feathers and attaching two wings to his arms. No other sources record the event. Writing in the 12th century, William of Malmesbury stated that the 11th century Benedictine monk Aylmer of Malmesbury attached wings to his hands and feet and flew a short distance. Beyond those based on William's account, there are no other known sources documenting Aylmer's life. Many others made well documented jumps in the following centuries. As late as 1811, Albrecht Berblinger constructed an ornithopter and jumped into the Danube at Ulm. Topic. Kites The kite may have been the first form of man-made aircraft. It was invented in China possibly as far back as the 5th century BC by Mozi and Lu Ban Later designs often emulated flying insects, birds, and other beasts, both real and mythical. Some were fitted with strings and whistles to make musical sounds while flying. Ancient and medieval Chinese sources describe kites being used to measure distances, test the wind, lift men, signal, and communicate and send messages. Kites spread from China around the world. After its introduction into India, the kite further evolved into the fighter kite, where an abrasive line is used to cut down other kites. 
Topic: <laughs> Man carrying kites. Man carrying kites are believed to have been used extensively in ancient China for both civil and military purposes and sometimes enforced as a punishment. An early recorded flight was that of the prisoner Yuan Huangtu, a Chinese prince, in the 6th century AD. Stories of man carrying kites also occur in Japan, following the introduction of the kite from China around the 7th century AD. It is said that at one time there was a Japanese law against man carrying kites. <laughs> Rotor wings The use of a rotor for vertical flight has existed since 400 BC in the form of the bamboo copter, an ancient Chinese toy. The similar, Moulinet Anoix, rotor on a nut, appeared in Europe in the 14th century AD. <laughs> Hot air balloons From ancient times the Chinese have understood that hot air rises and have applied the principle to a type of small hot air balloon called a sky lantern. A sky lantern consists of a paper balloon under or just inside which a small lamp is placed. Sky lanterns are traditionally launched for pleasure and during festivals. According to Joseph Needham, such lanterns were known in China from the 3rd century BC. Their military use is attributed to the general Zhuge Liang (180–234 AD), honorific title Kongming, who is said to have used them to scare the enemy troops. There is evidence that the Chinese also solved the problem of aerial navigation using balloons hundreds of years before the 18th century. Topic: The Renaissance. Eventually some investigators began to discover and define some of the basics of rational aircraft design. Most notable of these was Leonardo da Vinci, although his work remained unknown until 1797, and so had no influence on developments over the next 300 years. While his designs were at least rational, they were not based on particularly good science. Leonardo studied bird flight, analyzing it and anticipating many principles of aerodynamics. He did at least understand that, "...an object offers as much resistance to the air as the air does to the object." Newton would not publish the third law of motion until 1687. From the last years of the 15th century on he wrote about and sketched many designs for flying machines and mechanisms, including ornithopters, fixed-wing gliders, rotorcraft and parachutes. His early designs were man-powered types including ornithopters and rotorcraft, however he came to realize the impracticality of this and later turned to controlled gliding flight, also sketching some designs powered by a spring. <laughs> Lighter than air <laughs> Beginnings of modern theories In 1670 Francesco Lana de Terzi published a work that suggested lighter-than-air flight would be possible by using copper foil spheres that, containing a vacuum, would be lighter than the displaced air to lift an airship. While theoretically sound, his design was not feasible, the pressure of the surrounding air would crush the spheres. The idea of using vacuum to produce lift is now known as vacuum airship but remains unfeasible with any current materials. In 1709 Bartolomeu de Gushmau presented a petition to King John V of Portugal, begging for support for his invention of an airship, in which he expressed the greatest confidence. The public test of the machine, which was set for June 24, 1709, did not take place. According to contemporary reports, however, Gushmau appears to have made several less ambitious experiments with this machine, descending from eminences. It is certain that Gushmau was working on this principle at the public exhibition he gave before the court on August 8, 1709, in the hall of the Casa da India in Lisbon, when he propelled a ball to the roof by combustion. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Balloons. 1783 was a watershed year for ballooning and aviation. Between June 4 and December 1, five aviation firsts were achieved in France. On 4 June, the Montgolfier brothers demonstrated their unmanned hot air balloon at Annonay, France. 
On the 27th of August, Jacques Charles and the Robert brothers, Les Frères Robert, launched the world's first unmanned hydrogen-filled balloon from the Champ de Mars, Paris. On the 19th of October, the Montgolfiers launched the first manned flight, a tethered balloon with humans on board, at the Folie Titan in Paris. The aviators were the scientist Jean-François Pilatre de Rosier, the manufacturer manager Jean-Baptiste Reveillon, and Giroud de Villette. On 21 November, the Montgolfiers launched the first free flight with human passengers. King Louis XVI had originally decreed that condemned criminals would be the first pilots, but Jean-François Pilatre de Rosier, along with the Marquis François d'Arlons, successfully petitioned for the honour. They drifted 8 kilometers, 5.0 miles in a balloon powered by a wood fire. On the 1st of December, Jacques Charles and the Nicolas Louis Robert launched their manned hydrogen balloon from the Jardin des Tuileries in Paris as a crowd of 400,000 witnessed. They ascended to a height of about 1,800 feet, 550 meters, 15 and landed at sunset in nestles la vallee after a flight of 2 hours and 5 minutes, covering 36 kilometers. After Robert alighted Charles decided to ascend alone. This time he ascended rapidly to an altitude of about 9,800 feet 3, meters, where he saw the sun again, suffered extreme pain in his ears, and never flew again. Ballooning became a major rage in Europe in the late 18th century, providing the first detailed understanding of the relationship between altitude and the atmosphere. Non-steerable balloons were employed during the American Civil War by the Union Army Balloon Corps. The young Ferdinand von Zeppelin first flew as a balloon passenger with the Union Army of the Potomac in 1863. In the early 1900s ballooning was a popular sport in Britain. These privately owned balloons usually used coal gas as the lifting gas. This has half the lifting power of hydrogen so the balloons had to be larger, however coal gas was far more readily available and the local gas works sometimes provided a special lightweight formula for ballooning events. <laughs> Airships Airships were originally called «dirigible balloons» and are still sometimes called dirigibles today. Work on developing a steerable or dirigible balloon continued sporadically throughout the 19th century. The first powered, controlled, sustained lighter-than-air flight is believed to have taken place in 1852 when Henry Gifford flew 15 miles 24 kilometers in France, with a steam engine-driven craft. Another advance was made in 1884, when the first fully controllable free flight was made in a French Army electric-powered airship, La France, by Charles Renard and Arthur Krebs. The 170 foot 52 meters long 66,000 cubic foot 1,900 cubic meters airship covered 8 kilometers 5.0 miles in 23 minutes with the aid of an eight and a half horsepower electric motor however these aircraft were generally short-lived and extremely frail routine controlled flights would not occur until the advent of the internal combustion engine see below the first aircraft to make routine controlled flights were non-rigid airships sometimes called blimps. The most successful early pioneering pilot of this type of aircraft was the Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont who effectively combined a balloon with an internal combustion engine. On October 19, 1901 he flew his airship No. 6 over Paris from the Parc de Saint-Cloud around the Eiffel Tower and back in under 30 minutes to win the Deutsche de la Merth Prize. Santos Dumont went on to design and build several aircraft. Subsequent controversy surrounding his and others' competing claims with regard to aircraft overshadowed his great contribution to the development of airships. At the same time that non-rigid airships were starting to have some success, the first successful rigid airships were also being developed. These would be far more capable than fixed-wing aircraft in terms of pure cargo carrying capacity for decades. Rigid airship design and advancement was pioneered by the German Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Construction of the first Zeppelin airship began in 1899 in a floating assembly hall on Lake Constance in the Bay of Mansel, Friedrichshafen. This was intended to ease the starting procedure, as the hall could easily be aligned with the wind. The prototype airship LZ-1 LZ-4 Luftschiff Zeppelin 
had a length of 128 meters (420 feet), was driven by two 10.6 kilowatts (14.2 horsepower) Daimler engines and balanced by moving a weight between its two nacelles. Its first flight, on July 2, 1900, lasted for only 18 minutes, as LZ-1 was forced to land on the lake after the winding mechanism for the balancing weight had broken. Upon repair, the technology proved its potential in subsequent flights, bettering the 6 m per second speed attained by the French airship La France by 3 m per second, but could not yet convince possible investors. It would be several years before the Count was able to raise enough funds for another try. Although airships were used in both World War I and II, and continue on a limited basis to this day, their development has been largely overshadowed by heavier-than-aircraft. Heavier-than-air The 17th and 18th centuries Italian inventor Tito Livio Buratini, invited by the Polish king Vladislav IV to his court in Warsaw, built a model aircraft with four fixed glider wings in 1647. Described as, four pairs of wings attached to an elaborate dragon, it was said to have successfully lifted a cat in 1648 but not Buratini himself. He promised that, only the most minor injuries would result from landing the craft. His Dragon Volant is considered the most elaborate and sophisticated aeroplane to be built before the 19th century. The first published paper on aviation was Sketch of a Machine for Flying in the Air by Emanuel Swedenborg published in 1716. This flying machine consisted of a light frame covered with strong canvas and provided with two large oars or wings moving on a horizontal axis, arranged so that the upstroke met with no resistance while the downstroke provided lifting power. Swedenborg knew that the machine would not fly, but suggested it as a start and was confident that the problem would be solved. He wrote. It seems easier to talk of such a machine than to put it into actuality, for it requires greater force and less weight than exists in a human body. The science of mechanics might perhaps suggest a means, namely, a strong spiral spring. If these advantages and requisites are observed, perhaps in time to come some one might know how better to utilize our sketch and cause some addition to be made so as to accomplish that which we can only suggest. Yet there are sufficient proofs and examples from nature that such flights can take place without danger, although when the first trials are made you may have to pay for the experience, and not mind an arm or leg." Swedenborg would prove prescient in his observation that a method of powering of an aircraft was one of the critical problems to be overcome. On May 16, 1793, the Spanish inventor Diego Marin Aguilera managed to cross the river Arandilla in Corona del Conde, Castile, flying 300 to 400 meters, with a flying machine. The 19th century Balloon jumping replaced tower jumping, also demonstrating with typically fatal results that manpower and flapping wings were useless in achieving flight. At the same time scientific study of heavier-than-air flight began in earnest. In 1801, the French officer André-Guillaume Resnier de Gouy managed a 300-metre glide by starting from the top of the city walls of Angoulême and broke only one leg on arrival. In 1837 French mathematician and brigadier general Isidore Didion stated, "...aviation will be successful only if one finds an engine whose ratio with the weight of the device to be supported will be larger than current steam machines or the strength developed by humans or most of the animals." <laughs> Sir George Cayley and the first modern aircraft Sir George Cayley was first called the father of the aeroplane in 1846. During the last years of the previous century he had begun the first rigorous study of the physics of flight and would later design the first modern heavier-than-aircraft. Among his many achievements, his most important contributions to aeronautics include clarifying our ideas and laying down the principles of heavier-than-air flight reaching a scientific understanding of the principles of bird flight 
conducting scientific aerodynamic experiments demonstrating drag and streamlining, movement of the center of pressure, and the increase in lift from curving the wing surface. Defining the modern aeroplane configuration comprising a fixed wing, fuselage and tail assembly. Demonstrations of manned, gliding flight. Setting out the principles of power-to-weight ratio in sustaining flight, Cayley's first innovation was to study the basic science of lift by adopting the whirling arm test rig for use in aircraft research and using simple aerodynamic models on the arm, rather than attempting to fly a model of a complete design. In 1799 he set down the concept of the modern aeroplane as a fixed-wing flying machine with separate systems for lift, propulsion, and control. In 1804 Cayley constructed a model glider which was the first modern heavier-than-air flying machine, having the layout of a conventional modern aircraft with an inclined wing towards the front and adjustable tail at the back with both tailplane and fin. A movable weight allowed adjustment of the model's center of gravity. In 1809, goaded by the farcical antics of his contemporaries see above, he began the publication of a landmark three-part treatise titled, On Aerial Navigation, 1809–1810. In it he wrote the first scientific statement of the problem, The whole problem is confined within these limits, viz., to make a surface support a given weight by the application of power to the resistance of air. He identified the four vector forces that influence an aircraft, thrust, lift, drag and weight and distinguished stability and control in his designs. He also identified and described the importance of the cambered aerofoil, dihedral, diagonal bracing and drag reduction, and contributed to the understanding and design of ornithopters and parachutes. In 1848 he had progressed far enough to construct a glider in the form of a triplane large and safe enough to carry a child. A local boy was chosen but his name is not known, he went on to publish in 1852 the design for a full-size manned glider or governable parachute to be launched from a balloon and then to construct a version capable of launching from the top of a hill, which carried the first adult aviator across Brompton Dale in 1853. Minor inventions included the rubber-powered motor, which provided a reliable power source for research models. By 1808 he had even reinvented the wheel, devising the tension-spoked wheel in which all compression loads are carried by the rim, allowing a lightweight undercarriage. The age of steam Drawing directly from Cayley's work, Henson's 1842 design for an aerial steam carriage broke new ground. Although only a design, it was the first in history for a propeller-driven fixed-wing aircraft. 1866 saw the founding of the Aeronautical Society of Great Britain and two years later the world's first aeronautical exhibition was held at the Crystal Palace, London, where John Stringfellow was awarded a £100 prize for the steam engine with the best power-to-weight ratio. In 1848 Stringfellow achieved the first powered flight using an unmanned 10-feet wingspan steam-powered monoplane built in a disused lace factory in Chard, Somerset. Employing two contra-rotating propellers on the first attempt, made indoors, the machine flew 10 feet before becoming destabilized, damaging the craft. The second attempt was more successful, the machine leaving a guide wire to fly freely, achieving 30 yards of straight and level powered flight. Francis Herbert Wenham presented the first paper to the newly formed Aeronautical Society later the Royal Aeronautical Society, on aerial locomotion. He advanced Cayley's work on cambered wings, making important findings. To test his ideas, from 1858 he had constructed several gliders, both manned and unmanned, and with up to five stacked wings. He realized that long, thin wings are better than bat-like ones because they have more leading edge for their area. Today this relationship is known as the aspect ratio of a wing. The latter part of the 19th century became a period of intense study, characterized by the gentlemen scientists", who represented most research efforts until the 20th century. Among them was the British scientist philosopher and inventor Matthew Piers Watt Bolton, who studied lateral flight control and was the first to patent an aileron control system in 1868. In 1871 Wenham and Browning made the first wind tunnel. Meanwhile, the British advances had galvanized French researchers. In 1857 Félix du Temple proposed a monoplane with a tailplane and retractable undercarriage. 
Developing his ideas with a model powered first by clockwork and later by steam, he eventually achieved a short hop with a full-size man craft in 1874. It achieved lift-off under its own power after launching from a ramp, glided for a short time and returned safely to the ground, making it the first successful powered glide in history. In 1865 Louis-Pierre Mouillard published an influential book The Empire of the Air In 1856, Frenchman Jean-Marie Le Bris made the first flight higher than his point of departure, by having his glider, l'albatros artificial, pulled by a horse on a beach. He reportedly achieved a height of 100 meters, over a distance of 200 meters. Alphonse Penot, a Frenchman, advanced the theory of wing contours and aerodynamics and constructed successful models of aeroplanes, helicopters and ornithopters. In 1871 he flew the first aerodynamically stable fixed-wing aeroplane, a model monoplane he called the Plano 4, a distance of 40 meters 130 feet. Pennord's model incorporated several of Cayley's discoveries, including the use of a tail, wing dihedral for inherent stability, and rubber power. The Plano 4 also had longitudinal stability, being trimmed such that the tailplane was set at a smaller angle of incidence than the wings, an original and important contribution to the theory of aeronautics. Pennord's later project for an amphibian aeroplane, although never built, incorporated other modern features. A tailless monoplane with a single vertical fin and twin tractor propellers, it also featured hinge rear elevator and rudder surfaces, retractable undercarriage and a fully enclosed, instrumented cockpit. Equally authoritative as a theorist was Pennord's fellow countryman Victor Tayton. In 1879 he flew a model which, like Pennord's project, was a monoplane with twin tractor propellers but also had a separate horizontal tail. It was powered by compressed air. Flown tethered to a pole, this was the first model to take off under its own power. In 1884 Alexandre Goupil published his work La Locomotion Aérienne aerial locomotion, although the flying machine he later constructed failed to fly. In 1890 the French engineer Clement Adder completed the first of three steam-driven flying machines, the Eole. On October 9, 1890 Adder made an uncontrolled hop of around 50 metres 165 feet. this was the first manned airplane to take off under its own power. His Avion 3 of 1897, notable only for having twin steam engines, failed to fly. Adder would later claim success and was not debunked until 1910 when the French Army published its report on his attempt. Sir Hiram Maxim was an American engineer who had moved to England. He built his own whirling arm rig and wind tunnel, and constructed a large machine with a wingspan of 105 feet 32 meters, a length of 145 feet 44 meters, four and aft horizontal surfaces and a crew of three. Twin propellers were powered by two lightweight compound steam engines each delivering 180 horsepower 130 kilowatts. Overall weight was 8,000 pounds 3,600 kilograms. It was intended as a test rig to investigate aerodynamic lift, lacking flight controls it ran on rails, with a second set of rails above the wheels to restrain it. Completed in 1894, on its third run it broke from the rail, became airborne for about 200 yards at 2 to 3 feet of altitude and was badly damaged upon falling back to the ground. It was subsequently repaired, but Maxim abandoned his experiments shortly afterwards. Topic. Learning to glide In the last decade or so of the 19th century, a number of key figures were refining and defining the modern aeroplane. Lacking a suitable engine, aircraft work focused on stability and control in gliding flight. In 1879 Bio constructed a bird-like glider with the help of Massia and flew in it briefly. It is preserved in the Musée de l'Air, France, and is claimed to be the earliest man carrying flying machine still in existence. The Englishman Horatio Phillips made key contributions to aerodynamics. He conducted extensive wind tunnel research on aerofoil sections, proving the principles of aerodynamic lift foreseen by Cayley and Wenham. His findings underpin all modern aerofoil design. Between 1883 to 1886, the American John Joseph Montgomery developed a series of three-man gliders, before conducting his own independent investigations into aerodynamics and circulation of lift. Otto Lilienthal became known as the «Glider King» or «Flying Man» 
of Germany. He duplicated Wenham's work and greatly expanded on it in 1884, publishing his research in 1889 as Birdflight as the Basis of Aviation Der Vogelflug als Grundlage der Fliegerkunst. He also produced a series of hang gliders, including bat wing, monoplane and biplane forms, such as the Derwitzer glider and normal soaring apparatus. Starting in 1891 he became the first person to make controlled untethered glides routinely, and the first to be photographed flying a heavier-than-air machine, stimulating interest around the world. He rigorously documented his work, including photographs, and for this reason is one of the best known of the early pioneers. Lilienthal made over 2,000 glides until his death in 1896 from injuries sustained in a glider crash. Picking up where Lilienthal left off, Octave Chanute took up aircraft design after an early retirement, and funded the development of several gliders. In the summer of 1896 his team flew several of their designs eventually deciding that the best was a biplane design. Like Lilienthal, he documented and photographed his work. In Britain Percy Pilcher, who had worked for Maxim, built and successfully flew several gliders during the mid to late 1890s. The invention of the box kite during this period by the Australian Lawrence Hargrave would lead to the development of the practical biplane. In 1894 Hargrave linked four of his kites together, added a sling seat, and flew 16 feet 4 .9 meters. Later pioneers of manned kite flying included Samuel Franklin Cody in England and Captain Jeannie Sacconi in France. Langley. After a distinguished career in astronomy and shortly before becoming secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Samuel Pierpont Langley started a serious investigation into aerodynamics at what is today the University of Pittsburgh. In 1891 he published experiments in aerodynamics detailing his research, and then turned to building his designs. He hoped to achieve automatic aerodynamic stability, so he gave little consideration to in-flight control. On May 6, 1896, Langley's Aerodrome No. 5 made the first successful sustained flight of an unpiloted, engine-driven heavier-than-aircraft of substantial size. It was launched from a spring-actuated catapult mounted on top of a houseboat on the Potomac River near Quantico, Virginia. Two flights were made that afternoon, one of 1,005 meters 3,297 feet and a second of 700 meters 2,300 feet, at a speed of approximately 25 miles per hour 40 kilometers per hour. On both occasions the aerodrome No. 5 landed in the water as planned, because in order to save weight, it was not equipped with landing gear. On November 28, 1896, another successful flight was made with the aerodrome No. 6. This flight, of 1,460 metres 4, feet, was witnessed and photographed by Alexander Graham Bell. The aerodrome No. 6 was actually aerodrome No. 4 greatly modified. So little remained of the original aircraft that it was given a new designation. With the successes of the aerodrome No. 5 and No. 6, Langley started looking for funding to build a full-scale man-carrying version of his designs. Spurred by the Spanish–American War, the U.S. government granted him $50,000 to develop a man-carrying flying machine for aerial reconnaissance. Langley planned on building a scaled-up version known as the Aerodrome A, and started with the smaller quarter-scale aerodrome, which flew twice on June 18, 1901, and then again with a newer and more powerful engine in 1903. With the basic design apparently successfully tested, he then turned to the problem of a suitable engine. He contracted Stephen Balzer to build one, but was disappointed when it delivered only 8 horsepower kilowatts instead of 12 horsepower kilowatts he expected. Langley's assistant, Charles M. Manley, then reworked the design into a five-cylinder water-cooled radial that delivered 52 horsepower kilowatts at 950 revolutions per minute, a feat that took years to duplicate. Now with both power and a design, Langley put the two together with great hopes. To his dismay, the resulting aircraft proved to be too fragile. Simply scaling up the original small models resulted in a design that was too weak to hold itself together. Two launches in late 1903 both ended with the aerodrome immediately crashing into the water. The pilot, Manley, was rescued each time. 
Also, the aircraft's control system was inadequate to allow quick pilot responses, and it had no method of lateral control, and the aerodrome's aerial stability was marginal. Langley's attempts to gain further funding failed, and his efforts ended. Nine days after his second abortive launch on December 8, the Wright brothers successfully flew their flyer. Glenn Curtis made 93 modifications to the aerodrome and flew this very different aircraft in 1914. Without acknowledging the modifications, the Smithsonian Institution asserted that Langley's aerodrome was the first machine capable of flight. Topic: <laughs> Whitehead. Gustav Wyckoff was a German who emigrated to the U.S., where he soon changed his name to Whitehead. From 1897 to 1915, he designed and built early flying machines and engines. On August 14, 1901, two and a half years before the Wright brothers' flight, he claimed to have carried out a controlled, powered fight in his No. 21 monoplane at Fairfield, Connecticut. The flight was reported in the Bridgeport Sunday Herald local newspaper. About 30 years later, several people questioned by a researcher claimed to have seen that or other Whitehead flights. In March 2013 Jane's All the World's Aircraft, an authoritative source for contemporary aviation, published an editorial which accepted Whitehead's flight as the first manned, powered, controlled flight of a heavier-than-aircraft. The Smithsonian Institution custodians of the original Wright Flyer and many aviation historians continue to maintain that Whitehead did not fly as suggested. <laughs> the Wright brothers. Using a methodological approach and concentrating on the controllability of the aircraft, the brothers built and tested a series of kite and glider designs from 1900 to 1902 before attempting to build a powered design. The gliders worked, but not as well as the Wrights had expected based on the experiments and writings of their 19th century predecessors. Their first glider, launched in 1900, had only about half the lift they anticipated. Their second glider, built the following year, performed even more poorly. Rather than giving up, the Wrights constructed their own wind tunnel and created a number of sophisticated devices to measure lift and drag on the 200 wing designs they tested. As a result, the Wrights corrected earlier mistakes in calculations regarding drag and lift. Their testing and calculating produced a third glider with a higher aspect ratio and true three-axis control. They flew it successfully hundreds of times in 1902, and it performed far better than the previous models. By using a rigorous system of experimentation, involving wind tunnel testing of airfoils and flight testing of full-size prototypes, the Wrights not only built a working aircraft, the Wright Flyer, but also helped advance the science of aeronautical engineering. The Wrights appear to be the first to make serious studied attempts to simultaneously solve the power and control problems. Both problems proved difficult, but they never lost interest. They solved the control problem by inventing wing warping for roll control, combined with simultaneous yaw control with a steerable rear rudder. Almost as an afterthought, they designed and built a low-powered internal combustion engine. They also designed and carved wooden propellers that were more efficient than any before, enabling them to gain adequate performance from their low engine power. Although wing warping as a means of lateral control was used only briefly during the early history of aviation, the principle of combining lateral control in combination with a rudder was a key advance in aircraft control. While many aviation pioneers appeared to leave safety largely to chance, the Wright's design was greatly influenced by the need to teach themselves to fly without unreasonable risk to life and limb, by surviving crashes. This emphasis, as well as low engine power, was the reason for low flying speed and for taking off in a head wind. Performance, rather than safety, was the reason for the rear heavy design, because the canard could not be highly loaded, anhedral wings were less affected by crosswinds and were consistent with the low yaw stability. According to the Smithsonian Institution and Fédération Aéronautique Internationale FI, the Wrights made the first sustained, controlled, powered heavier-than-air man flight at Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, 4 miles 8 kilometers south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on December 17, 1903, the first flight by Orville Wright, of 120 feet 37 meters in 12 seconds, was recorded in a famous photograph. In the fourth flight of the same day, Wilbur Wright flew 852 feet 260 meters in 59 seconds. 
The flights were witnessed by three coastal life-saving crewmen, a local businessman, and a boy from the village, making these the first public flights and the first well-documented ones. Orville described the final flight of the day, the first few hundred feet were up and down, as before, but by the time 300 feet had been covered, the machine was under much better control. The course for the next four or five hundred feet had but little undulation. However, when out about 800 feet the machine began pitching again, and, in one of its darts downward, struck the ground. The distance over the ground was measured to be 852 feet 260 meters. the time of the flight was 59 seconds. The frame supporting the front rudder was badly broken, but the main part of the machine was not injured at all. We estimated that the machine could be put in condition for flight again in about a day or two. Quote, they flew only about 10 feet above the ground as a safety precaution, so they had little room to maneuver, and all four fights in the gusty winds ended in a bumpy and unintended landing. Quote dot. Modern analysis by Professor Fred E. C. Kulik and Henry R. Rex 1985 has demonstrated that the 1903 Wright Flyer was so unstable as to be almost unmanageable by anyone but the Wrights, who had trained themselves in the 1902 glider. The Wrights continued flying at Huffman Prairie near Dayton, Ohio in 1904 05. In May 1904 they introduced the Flyer II, a heavier and improved version of the original Flyer. On June 23, 1905 they first flew a third machine, the Flyer III. After a severe crash on 14 July 1905, they rebuilt the Flyer III and made important design changes. They almost doubled the size of the elevator and rudder and moved them about twice the distance from the wings. They added two fixed vertical vanes called blinkers between the elevators and gave the wings a very slight dihedral. They disconnected the rudder from the wing warping control and as in all future aircraft placed it on a separate control handle. When flights resumed the results were immediate. The serious pitch instability that hampered flyers Iron 2 was significantly reduced so repeated minor crashes were eliminated. Flights with the redesigned Flyer 3 started lasting over 10 minutes, then 20, then 30. Flyer 3 became the first practical aircraft, though without wheels and needing a launching device, flying consistently under full control and bringing its pilot back to the starting point safely and landing without damage. On the 5th of October 1905, Wilbur flew 24 miles, 39 kilometers in 39 minutes 23 seconds. According to the April 1907 issue of the Scientific American magazine, the Wright brothers seemed to have the most advanced knowledge of heavier-than-air navigation at the time. However, the same magazine issue also claimed that no public flight had been made in the United States before its April 1907 issue. Hence, they devised the Scientific American Aeronautic Trophy in order to encourage the development of a heavier-than-air flying machine. Topic: The Pioneer Era, 1903 to 1914. This period saw the development of practical aeroplanes and airships and their early application alongside balloons and kites for private, sport and military use. Topic: <laughs> Pioneers in Europe. Although full details of the Wright brothers' system of flight control had been published in Larifile in January 1906, the importance of this advance was not recognized, and European experimenters generally concentrated on attempting to produce inherently stable machines. Short-powered flights were performed in France by Romanian engineer Traian Vuia on March 18 and August 19, 1906 when he flew 12 and 24 metres, respectively, in a self-designed, fully self-propelled, fixed-wing aircraft, that possessed a fully wheeled undercarriage. He was followed by Jacob Elihammer who built a monoplane which he tested with a tether in Denmark on September 12, 1906, flying 42 meters. On September 13, 1906, a day after Elihammer's tethered flight and three years after the Wright brothers' flight, the Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont made a public flight in Paris with the 14 bis, also known as a sou de proie, French for bird of prey. 
This was of canard configuration with pronounced wing dihedral, and covered a distance of 60 metres 200 feet on the grounds of the Château de Bagatelle in Paris Bois de Boulogne before a large crowd of witnesses. This well-documented event was the first fight verified by the Aero Club de France of a powered heavier-than-air machine in Europe and won the Deutsche Archdeacon Prize for the first officially observed flight greater than 25 metres On November 12, 1906, Santos Dumont set the first world record recognized by the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale by flying 220 metres in 21.5 seconds. Only one more brief flight was made by the 14 bis in March 1907, after which it was abandoned. In March 1907, Gabriel Voisin flew the first example of his Voisin biplane. On 13 January 1908, a second example of the type was flown by Henry Farman to win the Deutsche Archdeacon Grand Prix d'Aviation Prize for a flight in which the aircraft flew a distance of more than a kilometre and landed at the point where it had taken off. The flight lasted 1 minute and 28 seconds. Topic: <inaudible> Flight as an established technology. Santos Dumont later added ailerons between the wings in an effort to gain more lateral stability. His final design, first flown in 1907, was the series of Demoiselle monoplanes, NOS 19 to 22. The Demoiselle No. 19 could be constructed in only 15 days and became the world's first series production aircraft. The Demoiselle achieved 120 km per hour. The fuselage consisted of three specially reinforced bamboo booms. The pilot sat a seat between the main wheels of a conventional landing gear whose pair of wire spoked main wheels were located at the lower front of the airframe, with a tailskid halfway back beneath the rear fuselage structure. The demoiselle was controlled in flight by a cruciform tail unit hinged on a form of universal joint at the aft end of the fuselage structure to function as elevator and rudder, with roll control provided through wing warping no. 20, with the wings only warping down. In 1908 Wilbur Wright travelled to Europe, and starting in August gave a series of flight demonstrations at Le Mans in France. The first demonstration, made on 8 August, attracted an audience including most of the major French aviation experimenters, who were astonished by the clear superiority of the Wright brothers' aircraft, particularly its ability to make tight controlled turns. The importance of using roll control in making turns was recognized by almost all the European experimenters. Henry Farman fitted ailerons to his voice and biplane and shortly afterwards set up his own aircraft construction business, whose first product was the influential Farman 3 biplane. The following year saw the widespread recognition of powered fighters something other than the preserve of dreamers and eccentrics. On 25 July Louis Blériot won worldwide fame by winning a £1,000 prize offered by the British Daily Mail newspaper for a flight across the English Channel, and in August around half a million people, including the President of France Armand Falliers and David Lloyd George, attended one of the first aviation meetings, the Grand Semaine d'Aviation at Reims. <laughs> Rotorcraft. In 1877, Enrico Forlanini developed an unmanned helicopter powered by a steam engine. It rose to a height of 13 meters, where it remained for 20 seconds, after a vertical takeoff from a park in Milan. The first time a manned helicopter is known to have risen off the ground was on a tethered flight in 1907 by the Breguet Richard gyroplane. Later the same year the Cornu helicopter, also French, made the first rotary wing-free flight at Lysinex, France. However, these were not practical designs. Topic: Military use. Almost as soon as they were invented, airplanes were used for military purposes. The first country to use them for military purposes was Italy, whose aircraft made reconnaissance, bombing and artillery correction flights in Libya during the Italian-Turkish War, September 1911 to October 1912. The first mission, a reconnaissance, occurred on the 23rd of October 1911. The first bombing mission was flown on the 1st of November 1911. Then Bulgaria followed this example. Its airplanes attacked and reconnoitred the Ottoman positions during the First Balkan War 1912–13. 
the first war to see major use of airplanes in offensive, defensive and reconnaissance capabilities was World War I. The Allies and Central Powers both used airplanes and airships extensively. While the concept of using the airplane as an offensive weapon was generally discounted before World War I, the idea of using it for photography was one that was not lost on any of the major forces. All of the major forces in Europe had light aircraft, typically derived from pre-war sporting designs, attached to their reconnaissance departments. Radio telephones were also being explored on airplanes, notably the minus 68 Seychelles rupees, as communication between pilots and ground commander grew more and more important. Topic: <laughs> World War One, 1914 to 1918. Topic. Combat schemes It was not long before aircraft were shooting at each other, but the lack of any sort of steady point for the gun was a problem. The French solved this problem when, in late 1914, Roland Garros attached a fixed machine gun to the front of his plane, but while Adolf Pegoud would become known as the first ace. Getting credit for five victories, before also becoming the first ace to die in action, it was German Luftstreitkraft Lieutenant Kurt Wintgens, who, on July 1, 1915, scored the very first aerial victory by a purpose-built fighter plane, with a synchronized machine gun. Aviators were styled as modern-day knights, doing individual combat with their enemies. Several pilots became famous for their air-to-air -air combat, the most well-known is Manfred von Richthofen, better known as the Red Baron, who shot down 80 planes in air-to-air -air combat with several different planes, the most celebrated of which was the Fokker Drive I. On the Allied side, René Paul Fonck is credited with the most all-time victories at 75, even when later wars are considered. France, Britain, Germany and Italy were the leading manufacturers of fighter planes that saw action during the war, with German aviation technologist Hugo Junkers showing the way to the future through his pioneering use of all-metal aircraft from late 1915. Topic: <laughs> Between the World Wars 1918 to 1939. The years between World War I and World War II saw great advancements in aircraft technology. Airplanes evolved from low-powered biplanes made from wood and fabric to sleek, high-powered monoplanes made of aluminum, based primarily on the founding work of Hugo Junkers during the World War I period and its adoption by American designer William Bushnell Stout and Soviet designer Andrei Tupolev. The age of the great rigid airships came and went. The first successful rotorcraft appeared in the form of the Autogyro, invented by Spanish engineer Juan de la Cieva and first flown in 1919. In this design, the rotor is not powered but is spun like a windmill by its passage through the air. A separate powerplant is used to propel the aircraft forwards. After World War I, experienced fighter pilots were eager to show off their skills. Many American pilots became barnstormers, flying into small towns across the country and showing off their flying abilities, as well as taking paying passengers for rides. Eventually the barnstormers grouped into more organized displays. Air shows sprang up around the country, with air races, acrobatic stunts, and feats of air superiority. The air races drove engine and airframe development. The Schneider Trophy, for example, led to a series of ever faster and sleeker monoplane designs culminating in the Supermarine S6B. With pilots competing for cash prizes, there was an incentive to go faster. Amelia Earhart was perhaps the most famous of those on the barnstorming, airshow circuit. She was also the first female pilot to achieve records such as crossing of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Other prizes, for distance and speed records, also drove development forwards. For example, on June 14, 1919, Captain John Alcock and Lieutenant Arthur Brown co-piloted a Vickers Vimy non-stop from St. John's, Newfoundland to Clifton, Ireland, winning the £13,000 $65,000 Northcliffe Prize. 
the first flight across the South Atlantic and the first aerial crossing using astronomical navigation, was made by the naval aviators Gago Coutinho and Sacadura Cabral in 1922, from Lisbon, Portugal, to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, with only internal means of navigation, in an aircraft specifically fitted for himself with an artificial horizon for aeronautical use, an invention that revolutionized air navigation at the time Gago Coutinho invented a type of sextant incorporating two spirit levels to provide an artificial horizon. Five years later Charles Lindbergh took the Orteg Prize of $25,000 for the first solo non-stop crossing of the Atlantic. Months after Lindbergh, Paul Redfern was the first to solo the Caribbean Sea and was last seen flying over Venezuela. Australian Sir Charles Kingsford Smith was the first to fly across the larger Pacific Ocean in the Southern Cross. His crew left Oakland, California to make the first Trans-Pacific flight to Australia in three stages. The first from Oakland to Hawaii was 2,400 miles, took 27 hours 25 minutes and was uneventful. They then flew to Suva, Fiji 3,100 miles away, taking 34 hours 30 minutes. This was the toughest part of the journey as they flew through a massive lightning storm near the equator. They then flew on to Brisbane in 20 hours, where they landed on 9 June 1928 after approximately 7,400 miles total flight. On arrival, Kingsford Smith was met by a huge crowd of 25,000 at Eagle Farm Airport in his hometown of Brisbane. Accompanying him were Australian aviator Charles Ulm as the relief pilot, and the Americans James Warner and Captain Harry Leon who were the radio operator, navigator and engineer. A week after they landed, Kingsford Smith and Ulm recorded a disc for Columbia talking about their trip. With Ulm, Kingsford Smith later continued his journey being the first in 1929 to circumnavigate the world, crossing the equator twice. The first lighter-than-air crossings of the Atlantic were made by airship in July 1919 by His Majesty's airship R-34 and crew when they flew from East Lothian, Scotland to Long Island, New York and then back to Pulham, England. By 1929, airship technology had advanced to the point that the first round the world flight was completed by the Graf Zeppelin in September and in October, the same aircraft inaugurated the first commercial transatlantic service. However, the age of the rigid airship ended following the destruction by fire of the Zeppelin LZ-129 Hindenburg just before landing at Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6, 1937, killing 35 of the 97 people aboard. Previous spectacular airship accidents, from the Wingford Express disaster 1919 to the loss of the R-101 1930, the Akron 1933 and the Macon 1935 had already cast doubt on airship safety, but with the disasters of the U.S. Navy's rigids showing the importance of solely using helium as the lifting medium, following the destruction of the Hindenburg, the remaining airship making international flights, the Graf Zeppelin was retired June 1937. Its replacement, the rigid airship Graf Zeppelin II, made a number of flights, primarily over Germany, from 1938 to 1939, but was grounded when Germany began World War II. Both remaining German Zeppelins were scrapped in 1940 to supply metal for the German Luftwaffe, the last American rigid airship, the Los Angeles, which had not flown since 1932, was dismantled in late 1939. Meanwhile, Germany, which was restricted by the Treaty of Versailles in its development of powered aircraft, developed gliding as a sport, especially at the Wassercup, during the 1920s. In its various forms, in the 21st century sailplane aviation now has over 400,000 participants. In 1929, Jimmy Doolittle developed instrument flight. 1929 also saw the first fighter by far the largest plane ever built until then, the Dornier du X with a wingspan of 48 meters. On its 70th test fight on October 21 there were 169 people on board, a record that was not broken for 20 years. Less than a decade after the development of the first practical rotorcraft of any type with the Autogyro, in the Soviet Union, Boris N. Uryev and Alexei M. Cheremukhin, two aeronautical engineers working at the Centralny Aerogidrodynamicheski Institute, constructed and flew the Zagi 1EA single rotor helicopter, which used an open tubing framework, a four blade main rotor, and twin sets of 1.8 metre diameter anti torque rotors, one set of two at the nose and one set of two at the tail. 
Powered by two M2 power plants, uprated copies of the GNOME monosupape rotary radial engine of World War I, the Zagi 1 EA made several successful low altitude flights. By 14 August 1932, Cherimukhan managed to get the 1EA up to an unofficial altitude of 605 metres 1,985 feet with what is likely to be the first successful single-lift rotor helicopter design ever tested and flown. Only five years after the German Dornier du X had flown, Tupolev designed the largest aircraft of the 1930s era, the Maxim Gorky in the Soviet Union by 1934, as the largest aircraft ever built using the Junkers methods of metal aircraft construction. In the 1930s development of the jet engine began in Germany and in Britain, both countries would go on to develop jet aircraft by the end of World War II. Topic: World War II, 1939 to 1945. World War II saw a great increase in the pace of development and production, not only of aircraft but also the associated flight-based weapon delivery systems. Air combat tactics and doctrines took advantage. Large-scale strategic bombing campaigns were launched, fighter escorts introduced and the more flexible aircraft and weapons allowed precise attacks on small targets with dive bombers, fighter bombers, and ground attack aircraft. New technologies like radar also allowed more coordinated and controlled deployment of air defense. The first jet aircraft to fly was the Heinkel He-178 Germany, flown by Erich Warsitz in 1939, followed by the world's first operational jet aircraft, the Mi-262, in July 1942 and world's first jet-powered bomber, the Arado R-234, in June 1943. British developments, like the Gloucester Meteor, followed afterwards, but saw only brief use in World War II. The first cruise missile V1, the first ballistic missile V2, the first and to date only operational rocket-powered combat aircraft Mi-163, with attained velocities of up to 1130 kilometers per hour, 700 miles per hour in test flights, and the first vertical takeoff manned point defense interceptor, the Batchim Bar 349 Natter, were also developed by Germany. However, jet and rocket aircraft had only limited impact due to their late introduction, fuel shortages, the lack of experienced pilots and the declining war industry of Germany. Not only airplanes, but also helicopters saw rapid development in the Second World War, with the introduction of the Fokakgelis FA-223, the Fletner Florida 282 Synchropter in 1941 in Germany and the Sikorsky R-4 in 1942 in the USA. Topic: The post-war era, 1945 to 1979. After World War II, commercial aviation grew rapidly, using mostly ex-military aircraft to transport people and cargo. This growth was accelerated by the glut of heavy and super-heavy bomber airframes like the B-29 and Lancaster that could be converted into commercial aircraft. The DC-3 also made for easier and longer commercial flights. The first commercial jet airliner to fly was the British de Havilland Comet. By 1952, the British state airline BOAC had introduced the Comet into scheduled service. While a technical achievement, the plane suffered a series of highly public failures, as the shape of the windows led to cracks due to metal fatigue. The fatigue was caused by cycles of pressurization and depressurization of the cabin, and eventually led to catastrophic failure of the plane's fuselage. By the time the problems were overcome, other jet airliner designs had already taken to the skies. USSR's Aeroflot became the first airline in the world to operate sustained regular jet services on September 15, 1956 with the Tupolev Tu-104. The Boeing 707 and DC-8 which established new levels of comfort, safety and passenger expectations, ushered in the age of mass commercial air travel, dubbed the Jet Age. In October 1947 Chuck Yeager took the rocket-powered Bell X-1 through the sound barrier. Although anecdotal evidence exists that some fighter pilots may have done so while dive-bombing ground targets during the war, this was the first controlled, level flight to exceed the speed of sound. Further barriers of distance fell in 1948 and 1952 with the first jet crossing of the Atlantic and the first non-stop flight to Australia. 
The 1945 invention of nuclear bombs briefly increased the strategic importance of military aircraft in the Cold War between East and West. Even a moderate fleet of long-range bombers could deliver a deadly blow to the enemy, so great efforts were made to develop countermeasures. At first, the supersonic interceptor aircraft were produced in considerable numbers. By 1955 most development efforts shifted to guided surface-to-air missiles. However, the approach diametrically changed when a new type of nuclear-carrying platform appeared that could not be stopped in any feasible way, intercontinental ballistic missiles. The possibility of these was demonstrated in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union. This action started the space race between the nations. In 1961, the sky was no longer the limit for manned flight, as Yuri Gagarin orbited once around the planet within 108 minutes, and then used the descent module of Vostok I to safely re-enter the atmosphere and reduce speed from Mach 25 using friction and converting the kinetic energy of the velocity into heat. The United States responded by launching Alan Shepard into space on a suborbital flight in a Mercury space capsule. With the launch of the Alouette I in 1963, Canada became the third country to send a satellite into space. The space race between the United States and the Soviet Union would ultimately lead to the landing of men on the Moon in 1969. In 1967, the X-15 set the airspeed record for an aircraft at 4,534 mph per hour or Mach 6.1. Aside from vehicles designed to fly in outer space, this record was renewed by X-43 in the 21st century. The Harrier jump jet, often referred to as just Harrier or the jump jet, is a British-designed military jet aircraft capable of vertical, short takeoff and landing v -STOL via thrust vectoring. It first flew in 1969, the same year that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the Moon, and Boeing unveiled the Boeing 747 and the Aerospatia BAC Concorde supersonic passenger airliner had its maiden flight. The Boeing 747 was the largest commercial passenger aircraft ever to fly, and still carries millions of passengers each year, though it has been superseded by the Airbus A380, which is capable of carrying up to 853 passengers. In 1975 Aeroflot started regular service on the Tu-144, the first supersonic passenger plane. In 1976 British Airways and Air France began supersonic service across the Atlantic, with Concorde. A few years earlier the SR-71 Blackbird had set the record for crossing the Atlantic in under two hours, and Concorde followed in its footsteps. In 1979 the Gossamer Albatross became the first human-powered aircraft to cross the English Channel. This achievement finally saw the realization of centuries of dreams of human flight. The digital age -present. The last quarter of the 20th century saw a change of emphasis. No longer was revolutionary progress made in flight speeds, distances and materials technology. This part of the century instead saw the spreading of the digital revolution both in flight avionics and in aircraft design and manufacturing techniques. In 1986 Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager flew an aircraft, the Rutan Voyager, around the world unrefueled, and without landing. In 1999 Bertrand Picard became the first person to circle the Earth in a balloon. Digital fly-by-wire systems allow an aircraft to be designed with relaxed static stability. Initially used to increase the maneuverability of military aircraft such as the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon, this is now being used to reduce drag on commercial airliners. The U.S. Centennial of Flight Commission was established in 1999 to encourage the broadest national and international participation in the celebration of 100 years of powered flight. It publicized and encouraged a number of programs, projects and events intended to educate people about the history of aviation. Topic: 21st century. 21st century aviation has seen increasing interest in fuel savings and fuel diversification as well as low-cost airlines and facilities. 
Additionally, much of the developing world that did not have good access to air transport has been steadily adding aircraft and facilities, though severe congestion remains a problem in many up-and-coming nations. 20,000 city pairs are served by commercial aviation, up from less than 10,000 as recently as 1996. There appears to be newfound interest in returning to the supersonic era whereby waning demand and bureaucratic hurdles in the turn of the 20th century made flights unprofitable, as well as the final commercial stoppage of the Concorde due to a fatal accident. In the beginning of the 21st century, digital technology allowed subsonic military aviation to begin eliminating the pilot in favor of remotely operated or completely autonomous unmanned aerial vehicles UAVs. In April 2001 the unmanned aircraft Global Hawk flew from Edwards AFB in the US to Australia non-stop and unrefueled. This is the longest point-to-point -point flight ever undertaken by an unmanned aircraft, and took 23 hours and 23 minutes. In October 2003 the first totally autonomous flight across the Atlantic by a computer-controlled model aircraft occurred. UAVs are now an established feature of modern warfare, carrying out pinpoint attacks under the control of a remote operator. Major disruptions to air travel in the 21st century included the closing of U.S. airspace due to the September 11 attacks, and the closing of most of European airspace after the 2010 eruption of Ayyafiatli Yakut. In 2015, André Borschberg flew a record distance of 4,481 miles 7 kilometers from Nagoya, Japan to Honolulu, Hawaii in a solar-powered plane, Solar Impulse 2. The flight took nearly five days, during the nights the aircraft used its batteries and the potential energy gained during the day. See also Aviation archaeology Claims to the first powered flight Early flying machines List of firsts in aviation Timeline of aviation <laughs>